three, two, one. Sir, thank you. Three, two, one. William, keep smiling, darling. Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Tessa Dunlop and this is a fact fiction analysis of series six, part two, The Crown. Have you seen it yet? Because this is full of spoilers, so go check it out first. And incidentally, Netflix didn't give any of us a sneak preview of episode 10. So this is an analysis of episodes five to nine, and I'll do one exclusively for episode 10 and put it on this channel very shortly. First off, let's look at Will Mania. This is Peter Morgan's device for examining William's popularity, his grief and his anger in the wake of his mother's death. A side note, this will be challenging, I think, some of this for Harry because it reinforces his role as the second player, the spare. But the programme's called The Crown. It's going to focus on those who are due to inherit the mantle of kingship. The other plus, of course, about William is he ain't going to divulge his emotional baggage so the crown can never really be proved wrong. In terms of the big emotional hug at Highgrove between father and son, the one-on-one -on -one with Grandad Philip at Eton and William, I really have my doubts. Upper class people don't really go in for incontinence, emotional sort of splurges. That's why Harry is like really throwing them at the moment. But we do have on record that William has a temper. Now that was probably baked in around the time of his mother's death, coming to terms with that. And we also know there are certain, is jealousy too strong, but certain competitive issues between him and his father. And again, that probably was baked in at about this time. William's emerging almost as a physical reincarnation of his mother, bonkers attractive on most young girls' wall of fit. And this is a challenge for Charles. Communication is difficult and all the attention is once again being sucked away from him and his journey going forward to become king. I'm going to come back to that relationship between Harry and William in a bit. Let's just focus quickly on Kate, paid brilliantly, I think, by Meg Bellamy, much better fit than Ed McVeigh's for William. But a lot of this story from the get-go is pure fantasy. We know Kate never met Diana, so that's a scratch out. Uh, it's very unlikely she was cutting out pictures of William as a teenager. She was older than William. It was Princess Elizabeth who was cutting out pictures of Philip in World War II, not Kate Middleton. Let's now get to the real grit in the oyster here, which is the role of Carol Middleton, Kate's mother. I had real issues with the depiction of her as this kind of leathery, Machiavellian desperado who was frantically pushing her daughter to marry the future king. It sort of smacked of sexism. It was kind of snobbish. We know that Kate later got the nickname Waity Katie, that she was seen to sort of hang around to wait to win the future king. We know that after William declared his hand going to St Andrews University, Kate swaps her university choice from Edinburgh to St Andrews. We know also that they both went on this rally expedition in Chile. They missed each other in their gap year by a matter of weeks. But to plant all that onto Carol Middleton and to give Kate none of the agency, I think is kind of weird. Where Carol Middleton did impact on her daughter's destiny is she was sufficiently self-made to be able to pay for an impressive series of public schools for her children, including Marlborough. So Kate was already in the right set. Regarding the Middleton ambition, Kate's ambition, who knows uh, that she should eventually end up with William. The spanner in the works is she did in her first year date Rupert Finch. That's depicted in the series, it is correct. He was from Norfolk. He was at St Andrews in the same halls of residence. He's now a lawyer, married to someone frightfully posh, a Marquess, I think, called Natasha. But the relationship between Kate and Rupert took place and both couples have remained subsequently good friends. I believe Rupert was at Kate and William's wedding, no less. There are bits that we know to be true. We know that Kate did wear famously that skimpy dress at a charity fashion show. William's head was turned. But Peter Morgan has had real fun here filling in the blanks. We don't know what happened in the family home in Berkshire when William rocks up to meet mum and dad and brother and sister. But it's highly unlikely it took place over the Golden Jubilee weekend because William was with his grandmother and the royal family throughout those celebrations. Can you imagine that a future heir to the throne is trying to just try his luck, driving straight up to the gates of Buckingham Palace? Please, did not happen. Nothing spontaneous happens when it comes to royalty. Likewise, that stuff about young Princess Elizabeth on VE Day night having a boogie in the basement of the Ritz with a black American soldier. No, no, no. 
did not happen. I can say this with real emphasis because I actually know a man who did spontaneously dance with Princess Elizabeth that night when she was allowed out with 16 chaperones. He was called Ronald, he was over six foot, he looked uncannily like Prince Philip, he was only 16 and he was, or she was rather, whisked away eventually by said chaperones. I can also confirm, because I mention it in my book, Elizabeth and Philip, she did very briefly go into the Ritz on her boogie through London. They had impressive revolving doors and she spanned through them. But as for a boogie underground, I don't think so. On that episode A in the relationship between Elizabeth and Margaret, yes, they were very close. Yes, Margaret had a heck of a time before she died, a series of nasty strokes and also scalding her feet quite badly. The timeline is a bit muddled up in The Crown. For a more accurate account, check out Lady in Waiting, Memoir and Glenn Connor's book. As for Margaret being a challenging patient, who did tend to self-sabotage. Yes, I can confirm that was true. About my only claim to fame is that my late grandfather, Sir Derek Dunlop, was, when the royal family were in Scotland, the late Queen's physician, and occasionally he came across Margaret and he struggled with her a bit. Now to President, or King, Tony Blair. The Prime Minister has a new nickname, King Tony. He must change not just the politics of this country, but the soul of this country. It's true, it was unusual for a Prime Minister to be more popular than the royal family, or certainly than the monarch. And Tony Blair, I think, was polling better than the Queen, very briefly, before the Iraq War, long before. Let's not forget, it had been a highly rocky decade for monarchy. And ironically, or tragically almost, Philip and Elizabeth were celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary just months after Diana's premature, awful death. And they go to this banquet at Banqueting House where the Prime Minister's there and the Queen addresses everyone. She gives a speech and she explains it's very hard for the royal family to read public mood. She actually says um, it's hard to reach, quote, obscured as it can be by deference, rhetoric or the conflicting current of public opinion. But read it, we must. And then she admits rather pitifully, I've done my best. And it is in the 1990s that polling starts on the royal family's popularity and what the public think of them and it's continued until this day and I'm afraid their popularity has gone down. But if the monarch is there for the long term, for better or for worse, not so the Prime Minister. They rarely last much longer than a decade at best, thank goodness. And Tony Blair definitely did get his comeuppance in front of the WI. There was a slow clap God love the Women's Institute. But actually, although Tony Blair wasn't her favourite Prime Minister, he was a little bit too bumptious and cocksure, I think the Queen probably had more issues with his wife, Sherry. The Queen Mother observed of Sherry that she had stiff knees. She didn't go down enough when she curtsied in front of the respective members of the royal family. Not suitably deferential. You gotta love the Queen Mother. I felt that the weak spot of this series was the relationship between Harry and William. And I think one of the reasons was Peter Morgan was being undercut, if you like, in real time. As he's filming The Crown Series 6, Harry is disemboweling, he's divulging in his Netflix series and in his own memoir that Morgan reckons he hasn't read. So that meant there was a kind of creative problem. Um, and what the result is, is a Harry who, on the one hand, is kind of needling his brother about being repressed and boring and uptight. And on the other hand, Harry, who's embracing a playful role, being a bit naughty, serving champagne in teacups. And it's like the series can't make up its mind. Do we take Harry's truth today, his unhappiness today? Or do we go with the line that we all believe for many years, which was, here was little charismatic Harry, who had his issues, but generally was kind of a good fun guy to be around. The bigger takeaway there is, William always was the one destined for the throne. So that meant just as the crown focused on William and ultimately all eyes in the royal family focused on William, the flip side of that was a problematic story for the spare. It's the fault line of monarchy and we've seen it play out horribly in recent years. It ain't easy being royal, but there are worse gigs in town. If you've enjoyed what you've listened to, please do give it a like and a subscribe and I'm off to watch the very final episode and I'll be back with an update of what I made of it.